When I grew up, I was the last of four kids in my family. That means there aren't really that many photos of me in the family album. You know what it's like. You take pictures every five minutes of your firstborn, uh, once a day maybe with the next. If you have three, you still take some pictures. But for number four, not so much. But there's one photo of me that I remember. It's this one. That's me at 11, poking my head out of an ancient hollow tree. I had just moved to a new place. It was the third time in my life that I moved. And I didn't really fit in, and I didn't really have any friends. Like so many youngsters, I dreamt of being in a different place. And I remember this tree, how I could squeeze in through a crack into the cavity. And I used to dream of entering it with my eyes closed. And then, as I opened them, I would be in a different world. A world where wonderful things would happen to me. A world where I had lots of cool companions. As an adult, as a grown-up, as a grown-up ecologist, I've learned a lot about trees. Now I know that if I indeed open my eyes inside an old tree like this, I am in a different world. The extraordinary world of insects. Because in here, a parallel reality exists, as if it was a true Narnia. Time and space have a different meaning, because a beetle has to live out its entire life in just one single summer. And a handful of rotten wood mold is the universe if you're less than one millimeter long. And if I'm looking for cool companions, I'm sure to find them here, because just one tree like this can have more insect inhabitants than there are people living in a big city like Manchester. So who are all these creatures living in here? Who would we meet if we were to look around? I'd like to take you on a journey in this extraordinary world of insects to show you some of the representatives that live in my tree and the relatives. Um, and show you why I think insects are extraordinary and how they save your life every day by recycling nutrients, by pollinating our food, and by playing an important role in the food web. So let's say that my tree is an oak. Then we would probably see some small apple-like things on the leaves. They are called galls. And it's actually this tiny gall wasp mama who can make the big oak tree create these galls as a house around her larvae. And that's amazing by itself, but even more amazing is the fact that if it wasn't for this gall wasp, it's far from certain that we could read old original manuscripts. Like the original will of Shakespeare, the sheet music of Beethoven, or the US Declaration of Independence. Because all these documents were written using gall ink made from wasp galls. And this non-soluble form of ink ate its way into the paper, making sure that even humid storage conditions would not destroy the writing. And while we're looking, up in the tree, we would probably also see some ants running around. They are tending to their livestock. Because yes, ants keep aphids as dairy cattle, or rather sugar cattle. Because aphids sip plant juices, and they produce this surplus liquid, really sweet liquid called honeydew. And the ants will come and carefully touch the aphids with their antenna, so the aphids release their sugary treat, 
and the ants can bring the produce back to the colony. And just like we tend to our farm animals, the ants will herd the aphids to the best parts of the plant to graze on, and they will, of course, protect them against all sorts of predators that might show up, just like we would do with our farm animals. And the aphids themselves might be worth a closer look to, because these insects are incredible at reproducing, often by virgin birth. Female aphids don't have time to hang around and wait for their eggs to hatch. So they just give birth to living baby aphids that develop from eggs that have not been fertilized. And some aphids can even be like Russian dolls. They give birth to female aphids that are themselves already carrying new aphids as they're being born. So it's no wonder that they can multiply and become many on your rose bush. So insects are fascinating and bizarre and strange, but they're also really useful for us. They run our world. And let's take a look at the insects that are in the waste management business. And let's say that one stormy night, our tree will drop a branch to the ground. That triggers a host of beetles and wasps and others to come and start their work. And they will, together with bacteria and fungi, slowly, slowly turn this branch into fertile soil again. And this happens with all sorts of dead plants, dead animals and dung. And it's crucial for life on Earth. Without it, no new life would be able to grow. The effect of this waste removal is best seen when it does not work, like the example of cow dung in Australia. The British brought the first cows to Australia, they multiplied and they produced lots and lots of dung. Trouble was, the Australian dung beetles were used to marsupial dung and they could not tackle the cow droppings. So they just dried into a crust, a thick crust so thick that the grass could not grow through it. And by 1960, large areas of Australia lay fallow and could not be used as grazing land because of this dung. And beetles had to be brought in from abroad to fix the problem and clear away the dung. Some insects can help us with other problems too, because it turns out that certain insects can actually digest plastic. The humble mealyworm can actually eat certain types of plastic and larvae that is raised on this diet will turn into adult beetles just as normal. And all that is left of the plastic is some carbon dioxide and a spot of beetle poo, clean enough to use as planting soil. So insects recycle, but they also pollinate. And some actually do both. Because one of the magic tricks of insects is that they can live two completely lives, one after the other. As kids or larvae, they might be uh, in the waste removal business, in a dead branch like this. But then, as they pupate and turn into adult flies or beetles, they become flower visitors and pollinators. Because pollination is really not about the honeybee, our domesticated flying friend. It's mainly about the several hundred thousand other insect species. All the wild bees, flies, beetles, moths and others that take part in pollination. And this diversity is paramount for successful pollination. By pollinating our food crops, like apples here, insects serve us an important part of the food we eat. Without insect pollination, three quarters of our major crop types would be gone. And without fruits, berries, nuts and veggies to eat, it would be difficult for us to get the nutrients and the vitamins we need in order to stay healthy. We would even miss some of the really nice sweet stuff. How many of you like chocolate? I do. Um, 
next time you're mad at a mosquito, please remind yourself it has a distant tropical cousin, the mosquito midge, which is actually the only one who can pollinate the cocoa flower so that we get chocolate. And insects will continue to pollinate our food crops and our wildflowers in the future, if we let them. They don't ask for much in return, really. Some decent patches of wildflowers, some woodlands and old trees in our farm landscape, meadows instead of lawns in our built-up areas. And many of these changes would actually make the surroundings much nicer for us humans, too. And because insects are so numerous, they are also important as food for bigger animals. Uh, birds and fish, and bats, mammals. Um, you know, 60% of the world's bird species are insect eaters. Each year, they gobble down 500 million tons of insects. Or, to put it in another way, if, if these birds were to eat us humans instead of insects, they could eat every single one of us in one year and still be hungry. So insects run our world, and they've done so since before the dinosaurs. They work tirelessly, 24-7, to uphold our ecosystems and help us humans survive. But have you ever received an invoice from a bumblebee? Of course not, because we humans have long taken these free services of insects for granted. But now, as intensive land use, pesticides and climate change are changing the ecosystem so quickly and so much, insects have difficulty delivering as they've done to date. We don't really know what the situation is like. The patterns are complex and we lack a lot of data. But there is little doubt that we are seeing a dramatic decline in insect biomass and diversity in a range of regions and ecosystems. And that should worry us. I'm a scientist and a writer. But I'm also a mother, and these are my three kids in another hollow tree some years ago. An important part of my motivation as a scientist, as an author, but also as a mom, is this. A deep-felt passion for the life of the tiny insects, coupled with a sense of urge that we need to understand what's at stake here. Let me put it this way. You can think of the world as a woven hammock. All the species on the planet and their lives form part of the weaving. And combined, they create this hammock that we humans are resting in. Insects are so numerous, they make up a large share of the hammock's fabric. If we continue, to reduce insect populations and wipe out insect species, it is as if we're pulling threads out of the weave. That might be okay, as long as there's just a few holes and loose threads. But if we pull out too many, the whole fabric will eventually unravel, and our welfare and well-being along with it. That's why keeping insects in business is a life insurance for future generations. A Canadian entomologist once said this, the world is so rich in small wonders, but so poor in eyes that can see them. My hope is that more people will open their eyes to this weird and wonderful world of insects and learn to appreciate 
the extraordinary and indispensable little lives they live alongside us on our shared planet. Thank you.